but let's go now. We let ourselves slide down through the transportation chute into the hangar, where we get into the protective suits. In Semyaza's beam ship, we then glide out into the primeval world and move about it for a long time. At various places, we leave her ship and I can capture some dinosaurs and landscapes on my slide film. Semyaza partially paralyzes the large animals from her ship, in order to make the filming easier for me. The animals then stand petrified. Then, as promised, she also takes a photo of Patai and me. After many hours, we go back into the Great Spacer. Billy says that was a fantastic excursion. Patar says no Earth human being ever had that opportunity. Later, we'll also show you the third world over there, and also its moon. The world there is about 870 years ahead of your time, thus, the human beings are also accordingly developed in their technology and have their own beam ships, with which they arrive at your Earth every now and then. Even on their moon, they have established themselves and have built many stations. We won't visit the middle world because it's not important. There is, indeed, manifold life on it, and its oxygen content is very high, but you've already seen such world bodies during your great journey. Billy says can't we fly there immediately? Semiaza says there are still various things to do, which we can do here. Billy says you are, once again, quite mysterious. Pata says it is no secret, we are searching here for an overdue beam ship of a life form known to us from our dimension. It penetrated a few days ago and has no possibilities for its own return. Billy says how will you find it? Pata says we've sent out several space analyzers, in order to explore everything. We will know the results in two to three hours at the latest. Billy says then we have to stay here so long. Semiaza says sure. Billy says very well, it certainly won't get boring, plus, I still have many questions. Pata says you are untiring in that. Billy says I'm just interested in everything. Semiaza announced to me at one of the earlier contacts that it should soon start again with the spiritual teaching, however, the good girl hasn't transmitted anything to me in relation to this. But on the other hand, it seems to me that she is concealing something from me. Patar says my daughter really is a little mysterious sometimes, concerning the spiritual teaching, she has also only given you partial information. The full fact is that the real spiritual teaching isn't supposed to be transmitted by us but rather from a very high spirit level, with which even we can only get in touch through the High Council, and that, in turn, only through Arahatathasatha. Billy says that would, indeed, be the level of pitale, through which the Twelve Commandments were given to us, right? Patar says that is so. In the future, certain information for the spiritual teaching will be transmitted to you from this level, but you then have to prepare everything definitively. The Ten Commandments, or more precisely, the Twelve Commandments, were the beginning of the transmissions. Since these transmissions demand exceptionally many forces from you, however, longer intervals must be kept from one transmission to another. Billy says but other human beings can, nevertheless, also receive ongoing transmissions, without being exhausted by it. Patar says you know very well that this isn't the case and that the majority of the so-called mediums truly has no contacts at all with such life forms or even other dimensioned life forms and that some of them are just subject to a self-deception or are quite consciously and deceitfully led to believe such contacts. They are only very few real contacts with higher levels, and valuable transmissions are even rarer. But earth human beings, who could have actual contacts in this form with other life forms and higher spirit levels, wouldn't just be able to pursue communication according to their liking and indefinitely because their forces would be very strongly diminished by these contacts, so these would have to be renewed for every new contact, which would often take many weeks or even several months. They would never be able to bear such force achievements, as they are demanded of you for they would surely die in complete exhaustion. You know why. 
Billy says of course. But your speech means that I will have to perform an enormous amount of work again because with Pitail, I have to write everything twice. I only receive the transmissions by hand, with the machine, it just doesn't work. Patar says I know that, and it has its reasons. But through Quetzal's technical assistance, you can, indeed, write very quickly with your writing utensil, whereby you still have to omit many sentences and often also write the wrong words, etc., by what means the opposite of what is said and explained, etc. often results, consequently, my daughter frequently has to sit down with you, in order to make the necessary corrections, which you must then insert between the written lines. Unfortunately, everything is a bit complicated, so regrettably, it can't be arranged differently. Billy says I can figure that out myself. Then I have to come to terms with the fact, whether I like it or not. Another question that I still have in stock concerns something else entirely. I would gladly like to know what's up with a certain Salvador Vilan Weaver Medina, who has written a book about his contacts with extraterrestrials and his flights to other planets. I've received the book to read from Mr. K. Admittedly, I have not yet read it through completely. Patar says you also shouldn't strive further for that because all the statements in this writing are freely invented. Billy says that means that the man is a fraud. Patar says in every sense, yes, even if he wants to serve a good purpose with it. Through various UFO reports, he has fallen to very strong fantasies and, moreover, has been very strongly influenced by Adamski. As one who wants to improve the world, with a certain hatred against the earthly human life forms, it was only an inevitable consequence for him to venture to the public with dishonest assertions in his work, which, by the way, wasn't written by him. Billy says oh, so that's it, but why, then? Does he feel hatred in himself against the earth human beings? Semyaza says on the one hand, because he isn't able to reach any position of power, due to his minimal abilities in every respect, and on the other hand, because his own appearance depresses him and he appears disproportionate to himself. Billy says aha, then that would probably be the reason why he says in his book, with regard to the alleged two Frenchmen on the imaginary planet, that they were typically disproportionate and ugly earth human beings, right? Psychologically seen, I can at least find in this the reason for this description. Patar says you think very sharply and precisely. The reason for his statement is actually to be found in that. Billy says how could it be otherwise? But from his statement, which I find very derogatory for the earth human beings, the question arises what really is the case with this? By that, I mean, whether the earth human being is actually so disproportionate and ugly, when he is compared to other life forms in the universe. Patar says the earth human being is a descendant of a human form from the depths of the universe that is very highly developed in every way. Accordingly, he is also highly developed in his proportional form. In this connection, he is on an equal footing with our own race, which is already approximately 30 million years further developed. Even life forms that are still further developed have no better or more beautiful proportions, and even among them, there are those whom the earth human being would describe as ugly. The proportional beauty of the earth human being was already recognized in ancient Greece which is why the human beings surpassing this standard of beauty were called Adonis good-looking ones. At that time, the earth human being was somewhat wild, so the real beauty was only recognized in a few, while those, through whom it was recognized, were called the beautiful ones, if I use the current earth human terms for it. At the present time, However, since the earth human being has discarded his greatest wildness and consciously cares for his appearance, his given beauty comes to validity in its entire appearance. So today, in this regard, the majority of earth humanity can be spoken of as Adonis forms. This refers to the earth human being's physiognomic, shape-related and proportional appearance. The earth human being is one of the most well-proportioned and best-looking human life forms in the universe, 
who is only somewhat surpassed by his actual ancestors, who have reached the best possible perfection in proportional regard. The difference, however, is no longer very great because the material form is subject to limits and cannot be extended. Billy says then the assertion of Vilhan Weaver is rubbish, so to speak, thus a somewhat underdeveloped spiritual stink bomb. Patar says certainly, if you want to express it like that. Billy says so accordingly, there should be no so-called supernatural beauty, etc. Patar says those are outright fantasies of ignorant earth human life forms who through these, want to make their fraudulent claims believable, that they had come into contact with extraterrestrials. In the whole universe, neither in this one nor in another, can the standard of beauty be exceeded, for it truly is limited. If this limit is exceeded, however, then a degeneration already takes place, and the life form in question must be described as ugly again, if I judge according to earthly concepts of beauty. Hence, there can also be no supernatural beauty, as you've mentioned this. Everything that is material is subject to certain limits that can never be exceeded. Only the imagination is able to exceed these limits, but without ever being able to realize it. Billy says nevertheless, Elizabeth Clara, for example, has also stated that she encountered an extraterrestrial of supernatural beauty and even bore him a son. In addition, Adamski and various others spoke of an earthly or supernatural beauty. Patar says any rationally thinking earth human being can recognize the untruthfulness of their claims because only the imagination can produce such images. They are, however, nothing more than mirages, which exhibit momentary fata morgana manifestations and then fade away again for good in the very next split second. Billy says then how do you classify the interpretation of Vilhan Weaver? Patar says it is a world improvable deformation of the earth human beings that is born from hatred. Billy says so an insult to us earthworms? Patar says that is so. Billy says then his philanthropy really isn't fetched from afar. Patar says it is only feigned and serves for the purpose of profit. Billy says then the case is, indeed, clear. There's something else, however, that you should explain for everyone for the interest of our cause, namely the connections or certain connections with the age of the earth human being. I already know about these things because Farth informed me about them when I was a boy. Nevertheless, these things were never written down, so others aren't oriented about them. I'm referring to the fact that the mental forces of every single human being are capable of raising or lowering the life force of others. Patar says certainly, this question is of great importance, and I will give you information about that for everyone. The age of each life form is partially determined by the external forces penetrating on them of a cosmic as well as environmental and nutritional nature, etc., as well as by forces of other similar life forms, and to be sure, the genes play the predominant role. Because the thinking of a life form through the cooperation of the spirit produces an extremely logical, thus, creation-related force that is released as high-frequented vibrations and radiations, a tremendous force is, thus, produced, which can influence everything. This creation-related force penetrates into everything, truly into all material life forms and all matter, in order to influence them according to their type and form. Every life form has its genes and its standard of living appropriate for its life span, so even the human forms of the earth. At the earliest times, when the human being of the earth was also produced by his indirect ancestors, his average age was reckoned at 1007 years of life, for he, trained and informed by his producers, possessed an enormous level of knowledge and abilities. Unexpectedly quickly, However, he fell to the religions with their erroneous teachings and was thereby deprived of the true knowledge and the truth. He also necessarily began to work against all natural laws, became alien to them, and lived in a commandment-breaking and law-breaking manner. Everything together served for the loss of the high average life span, which fell lower and lower over the course of thousands of years and leveled off at a twentieth of its earlier time 
and indeed, especially because many different factors over many thousands of years negatively